traditional custodians of the land of Gympie, where Noel was born and raised. I acknowledge the Wongal people of the Aora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land here in Strathfield where we are gathered. And I acknowledge the Darug people, the traditional custodians of the land where Noel's body will be laid to rest. I acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, and commit to walk with them the paths of respect, reconciliation and recognition. Some housekeeping, thank you for observing physical distancing. It's awkward, but while it's strange for all of us, it's important to care for each other at this time of the coronavirus. So please continue to do this throughout the funeral proceedings. Please put your phones on the side. Please put your phones on silent and toilets are available outside on your right. So I acknowledge and welcome the people who have received Noel, who have known and loved him in life, whom he has loved and served, who have drawn missionary ministry out of him. So first is the Connolly family. Noel's only surviving sibling, Tony, and his family are with us on live streaming. Mauricia Wolfe, Noel's niece, and her two sons, Brenton and Aidan, are here present. And David and Judy Connolly, Noel's cousin, and his wife, whose home was also Noel's, are also present with us. Next to the Columbans, my name is Patrick McInerney. I'm the coordinator of the Columbans in Sydney. Father Trevor Trotter is the regional director of Oceania. Father Peter O'Neill is the Columban leader in Australia. And we have Father Reg Howard, Father Paul McGee, Father Ray Scanlon, uh, Father Hans Meyer, Father Charles Rue. And also joining us, Bishop Terry Brady, united in Noel's commitment to justice, peace, and the poor representing the Archdiocese of Sydney, Father Pius Kwak from the Korean community, and a special thanks to Father Jack for hosting us here today. I acknowledge, and there are other Columban priests also present in the congregation, I acknowledge and welcome Noel's close friends who journeyed with him in life and love, in celebration and in sorrow. I acknowledge and welcome the representatives of the various organizations with whom Noel has worked. That includes PMI, CMI, the Korean community, the Chinese community, CIS, BBI, Catholic Religious Australia, and Catholic Mission, and many others. Many other people would be here with us today were it not for COVID-19 restrictions. I acknowledge and welcome the many people around Sydney, Australia, and the world who are with us through live streaming. Finally, all of us here in St. Martha's and online are gathered to acknowledge Noel Connolly, brother, Columban, priest, missionary, mentor, guide, passionate, educator, raconteur, visionary, servant, prophet, humble, humorous, and much more besides, as testified in the many tributes that have been pouring in as news of his death spread. And one more, which has not yet appeared in dispatches, fruit of his missionary journeys traversing Australia, member of the Qantas Club. <laughs> in an article in the February Columban E-News this year entitled what I have learned from being weak, Noel wrote, we are not only like God when we are strong and loving others, it is a beautiful thing to love. It is perhaps an even more gracious and beautiful thing to be loved. Then we are releasing the lover in others. 
It is typical of Noel's homespun gospel wisdom, reflections carved out of his own experience. But I admit, I smiled when I read the phrase, releasing the lover in others. And I thought, Noel, you may be weak, but you're still in charge. <laughs> releasing the lover in others. As if we can't do it ourselves without your leave. So you're still in charge, as you have been throughout the many responsibilities thrust upon you in your Columban life. But last Saturday, on the vigil of the Feast of the Holy Trinity, Noel finally did let someone else take charge, wholly and completely, and was enfolded into the arms of the Trinity, whom he had served so faithfully throughout his life. We gather today to remember Noel, to give thanks, to pray for him, to comfort one another in our loss, and to commend him to God and the communion of the saints. We gather then in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Paschal candle is lighted here. In baptism, Noel received the light of Christ. It has guided him throughout his life. May this light now lead him into eternal life. In the waters of baptism, Noel died with Christ and rose with him into eternal life. May he now share. Noel's coffin is covered with a white pall, a reminder that on the day of his baptism, Noel was clothed in Christ and given Christian dignity forever. May Christ now enrolled him in his love and bring him to eternal life. And the symbols to be placed on the coffin, first is the mission cross. On taking membership in the Columban Society, every Columban is given a mission cross. To Father Charles Rue, a fellow Columban missionary to Ch Korea and confrere of Knowles here in Sydney, will place Knowles' mission cross on his coffin. The priest and congregation together offer the Eucharist renewing Christ's sacrificial death for love of the world and all its peoples. Father Reg Howard, who was in the seminary with Noel and a Columban confrere in Sydney, will place a chalice on Noel's coffin. The stole is a sign of priestly service. Father Ray Scanlon, a Columban from Melbourne, who was also a fellow missionary to Korea, will place the stole on Noel's coffin. Noel loved good food, good wine, and good company. He loved to cook, to entertain, to regale his guests, and to create community. As a sign of Noel's master chef hospitality, 
His two great nephews, Brenton and Aidan Wolf, will place a cookbook and a bottle of wine on his coffin. If you please be seated, I'd invite David Connolly, Noel's cousin, to share his reflections on Noel on behalf of the Connolly family. Good morning. My name is David Connolly. I'm Noel's cousin. Although he is known to you as Noel, within the Connolly family and to his Queensland friends, he was known as John. In January 1945, John was born in Gympie, Queensland, the first child of Sarah, known to the family as Connie, and Noel Connolly, and was named Noel John Connolly. During the next few years, his sister Mary and brother Tony were born. Their home in Gympie was on the top, uh, on the top of Calton Hill in the original Connolly house. Later, John's parents built a house next door. Next door again was the Christian Brothers' house and across the road were the Brothers' School, then called Little Flower College, the Convent of Mercy, the Convent School, and St. Patrick's Catholic Church. It seems that John and his siblings grew up in the Gympie Catholic ghetto. By the time John was in primary school, most of the Connolly aunts and uncles had left Gympie. My parents and I moved from Gympie to Brisbane by the time I was five, and during my school years, there were only a few occasions when I remember seeing John, Mary and Tony in Brisbane. Consequently, to speak of John's school days, I'm relying on the memories of Sister Anne O'Farrell, who grew up, grew up with John in Gympie, and the two families were very close. John excelled at school through a lot of hard work and was the ducks of his senior year. During his secondary school, he played rugby league for the college and later played rugby union in the seminary and while studying in Italy. He maintained lifelong friendships with many from his Gimpy school days. Five of, his, five of his grade one class celebrated the 50th anniversary of his ordination with him in January this year. The gathering was a luncheon at Tugan on the Gold Coast. Over the years, John maintained contact with many of his school friends, visiting them every Christmas. John left to join the Columbans in early 1963 after completing senior in 1962. During his seminary years, he returned to Gympie in the Christmas holidays and worked for the post office. He was a local postie and had to bike up and down the Gympie Hills. This maintained his footy fitness. John was keen on fitness and successfully ran a marathon in Sydney, but collapsed at the finish line. The first his mother knew uh, that he was back in Australia was when she saw this incident on the TV news. <laughs> John's mother had always insisted that whenever he returned to Australia, he had to head straight to Gympie to be with her. You may find this desire for fitness hard to believe given his girth in later years. During his seminary days, the Second Vatican Council was in full swing in Rome and John embraced the documents coming from it. A number of his aunts and uncles found a number of the liturgical changes difficult to accept. John was wont to say with a laugh that they held him personally responsible for the changes. The Connollys were not backward in expressing their views. 
John was ordained in Gympie in 1969 and at the time he had a broken leg. His first posting in 1970 was to assist in the parish of Bow Desert in southern Queensland. Later, in the same year, he left for Korea. This fulfilled his desire to be a missionary. While he was in Korea, <coughs> his sister Mary tragically passed away, leaving behind Marisha, a seventh-month-old baby girl. Sadly, the Conley family had no contact with Marisha for many years. However, from time to time, John was able to see her during her childhood years on his trips back to Australia. By 1975, when I travelled overseas with two friends for, six month, for a six-month trip, John was studying in Rome. During the summer holidays, he worked as a curate to the parish priest in a small village in Germany called Bierlingen. We stayed there in our camper van for a few days where he introduced us to the local people and customs. By then he was fluent in German as well as Italian and Korean. On one occasion, because, he attended, because we attended the local tavern with John, we were seated at a special table reserved for village dignitaries. We, weren't, we learned later that this caused a few raised eyebrows. When John worked in Ireland for many years, several friends and family visited him. This pleased him greatly, as he was known for his genuine hospitality. My family visited him on two occasions, once in 1992 and again in 1999. On this latter occasion, the highlight for us was visiting the original Connolly home in Ballinsleigh, Eastern County Galway. Local folklore had it that a curse had been placed on the house by the farm tenants in the early 1800s while the Connollys were the owners. This was given credence by a number of accidental deaths occurring on the property over the years. John had been asked not long before our visit to perform an exorcism at the property. He refused but did say a home mass at the property for the family. The telling of this story could take John about 40 minutes, noting every detail. Once he returned to Australia, each Christmas he continued his annual pilgrimage to visit family and friends in Queensland. John's great joy was 16 years ago when his niece Marisha made contact with him after she learnt that she had an uncle who was a Columban priest. By then, Marisha, uh, by Marisha, by then Marisha was married to Rick and was the mother of two young boys, Brenton and Aidan. The whole family was overjoyed. For the, for the last 20 plus years, John spent every Christmas with my family and part of the Christmas Eve ritual was a home mass followed by a special meal. He always finished the mass with a statement, sadly, sadly, this was another year without a collection. For me, his passing means the loss of a great friend and the brother I never had. I'll miss him dearly. May he rest in peace. Thank you, David. And I now invite Sister Maureen Andrews of the Franciscan Missionary Franciscan Sisters of the Immaculate Conception, a close friend of Noel's over many decades, to share her reflections on Noel.
Life is so precious, isn't it? And um, I count myself lucky that Noel Colney was my precious friend for 41 years. And what joy we packed into those years. And uh, it's my belief that this friendship brought out the best in us and allowed us to love others and commit ourselves to wholeheartedly <clears throat> to the life that we'd chosen as Columban priest and Franciscan sister. As Noel says in his video on the Columban website that's up there now, love is worthwhile. And it's so true, isn't it? So how can I describe this loyal priest and com committed Columban missionary who lectured with such enthusiasm and energy all around Australia? Well, to me, I thought he was grateful, generous, gregarious, and hopeful. He often said that gratitude was the basic um, value for any Christian person, a value that we should cultivate. And he was generous, generous to people on the street sitting there wanting money. He'd say, well, we've had a good meal, let's look after them or to NGOs who are in need of money. And also generous with his time. We know he was overcommitted, that every year he would come uh, where I used to live. Currently I'm living in Kanamala, been there for 10 years, and he came every year for two weeks and ministered to us, and the people at Kanamala just loved him. Well, he was gregarious. Oh, he loved to tell stories. So many of those stories I've heard many times. Even if you were sitting at the driver reviver, which I was supposed to be personing, he'd arrive and take over. And I thought, well, I can sit in the back, which was grand. So he loved telling stories. He loved entertaining with meals, whiskey and red wine, everything there in abundance. So there's going to be some wine merchants who are not happy with his passing. Their profits will go down. And he was so hopeful, even to the end. He'd wanted me to come down, and I said, yes, I will come. And then, you know, we thought it would be good. I'd come down, and we'd just spend a couple of weeks when he was in and out of hospital, just sit there with him. And he, he was saying, well, I might be, I might be a little bit um, stronger when you come. I might even be able to eat. Anyway, that, that kept us going. And uh, one thing puzzles me though, how could such a person who had such a tidy, disciplined mind work in a room where there were papers scattered on floors, shoved between cupboards, on top of cupboards, and folders that looked like they were going to fall out at any minute? So, when he arrived in Kanamala, chaos reigned. He'd sit in my lounge room and spread out all over the table. And I couldn't get him to pack it up. I'd pack it up and that annoyed him completely. But anyway, that's it. Um, so December 2019 was frightening when I saw him. He was so weak and ill. And the two weeks he, he, he was at Kanamala, he spoke powerfully to the people and Pat talked about the article, David talked about it, and um, learning to live with weakness. And this, that article was in the Far East. Oh, it was so good, wasn't it? But so scary and so honest. And so one of the last images I have in my mind is him, uh, he couldn't get out of the chair at Mass, it was such an effort, so he sat there all the time. And at the end of church, here he is sitting at the end, and one of the, the big gruff farmer we have, he's kneeling down beside him saying goodbye, and there's a few other people gathered round. And I just thought it was so beautiful. But in a sense, it was like a farewell, really. Well, this impatient, determined man. I miss seeing him at the end. He slipped away so peacefully. And I thought it was so inconvenient of him. I was coming down and there he'd gone. I missed him by that short time. However, I think it was a fitting time for him to die. It was the eve of the Trinity and that feast reminds us that God is not some remote out there. He's not remote, 
God is relational. And if one, that's what Noah was. People were so important. He loved them, loved his friends. And uh, so on that feast, we remember that love binds us all together. And that love we have comes from God. So I'll forgive him for not being there when I arrived. But I still feel his presence hovering around me. And um, I call on that to get me through those days, these days. And so, my precious friend, I say to you, au revoir, but not goodbye. Thank you, Maureen. And now I invite Catherine Melville, another close friend of Noel's and part of the Columban Alumni Network to share some stories about Noel. The weak are very conscious of their weakness and the powerful are rarely conscious of their strength. Noel said it often, he wrote it often. My name is Catherine Melville. I was known as Cathy when I studied, at least sometimes, at the PMI in 1982, before going to Chile under Columban auspices. It would be fair to say that Noel was conscious of his strength at the 1982 Taramara State of Origin Ping Pong Championships. <laughs> he and Warren Kinney wore maroon. They may have argued as to whether theirs was the Connolly Kinney team or the Kinney Connolly team. Either way, they were determined. That poor ping pong table got a pounding that night, with most of us ducking for cover. Queensland won. It is not true that Peter O'Neill enrolled Kevin for the following year to introduce some navy blue balance. I represent Noel's students, particularly those many who became dear friends. I do not pretend I can speak on behalf of those many people in many time zones. I'm encouraged to frame some words, to hold that ambivalence between representing and not speaking on others' behalf because of Noel's acceptance of how important we are to one another. To lean into the gist of one of Noel's favourite quotes, none of us is an island entirely of itself. Everyone is part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, our land is less. Noel was also an alumnus of Taramara, from a different time to mine. I am told that in the showers, his was the warbling, unique rendition of an old classic. I love Paris in the springtime. I love pra Paris in the summer when it sizzles. He introduced other students to good art, some of which found its way to the seminary walls. Noel would have bristled at being the youngest in his class, and thus the most junior, because even desk placement was based on a hierarchy afforded by age. Throughout his Columban life, Noel took on the mantle of leadership or control, even when it was not deemed to be his role. And when it was, he became rector in 1979 at the age of 34. Three years later, I was the one who knew enough not to ask how to spell Newtix, the family name of a chap called Herman. Paul, my beloved, who also started his study at Tara that year, knew hermeneutics far better than did I. We did not get on until both of us had left Columban life. It is not possible, nor desirable, to leave behind Columban impact. Looking at the picture of Noel and me together in 1982, it's not clear why either of us wanted to lose weight. 
we, or at least he, made it a competition between us. He won. He still paid for dinner out. As we left the seminary that evening, silence seemed my better option as he hooned in the Commodore across the orchard to exit via the back exit to avoid a particular person pacing the main driveway. If Norb or Cyril saw, they also adopted silence. It was the first of many significant occasions when Noel and I broke bread and drank wine and talked about all manner of things. Noel was a homilist, even when he was a lecturer. We quote him often, the better is the enemy of the good. Marriage is a courageous act because more than likely, one of the people will bury the other. Love is not all you need. You don't know where someone is starting from. Learning that web and weave was important to me because the following year I was employed as a homilist with the Sydney Catholic Mission Office. It was lawful back then for a woman to do that in this diocese. Noel reflected on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of his ordination last July, that starting out as a newly minted priest, he anticipated several challenges that he might face. However, he did not remotely anticipate the defining challenge of the years ahead, uncertainty. Certainty is a spectrum, one which fades with increasing complexity. Paul and I were the beneficiaries of Noel's uncertainty and his grapple with an increasingly complex world. For a few beautiful years, He would arrive most weekends at our place in Concord, having walked from Homebush Road listening to LNL over pastor or slow cook lamb shanks, always accompanied by Chardonnay and Shiraz, Noel, Paul and I ebbed and flowed about the gorgeous and challenging nature of life, family, community, politics, beliefs, work, organisational structures. After the 2015 assassination in the Charlie Hebdo offices in Paris, his sense of the witness power conundrum came again into our conversation. Noel could not quite bring himself to say, je suis Charlie, because he believed satire is best directed at the rich and the powerful. He enjoyed satire and all manner of humor. Noel and our eldest son would spar in the deprecating ways which both of them enjoy. Manly's parlous results were always good value for Dante. There's a photo somewhere of knees, Noel's knees folding underneath him, literally on the finish line after completing a marathon. Those of us who found it difficult to support his fidelity to facilitating the preparation for the plenary are reminded of that determination. His commitment was to a church that was missionary, that engaged backward and forward with so-called secular society, and to an institution that, called out by compelling evidence of child sexual abuse, sought forgiveness rather than preached forgiveness. Like all of us, it was personal experience of a truth that brought home its import. In Noel's case, it was his illness that convinced him that the weak are very conscious of their weakness and the powerful are rarely conscious of their strength. He became very conscious of his weakness because his body's fragility would simply not allow him to be strong. Even then, he worried that he was being self-indulgent. He loved humanity and was of it and in it and felt it. On the day after Noel died, I finally found the part in Paul Tornier's book from which Noel remembered the consciousness of weakness, quote, something both of us had tried to do over the years. Noel's is a better summary, says I. It was not the book of Tornier's which Noel thought it was. I went to ring him. He's not available. In other times, there would be more than 10 times this number of attendees inside St. Martha's including multiple generations of my family and the Vagonas, 
more members of the Chinese and Korean Catholic communities, plenary people, all sorts of people, current, former and affiliated Columbans, friends and of course the students I represent. His gorgeous niece, Marisha, is present, as is his brother cousin, David, as is Maureen. And Noel's relationships were always here and there and far across the world. None of us knew, except perhaps in retrospect, that it was the last time we would have a chance to say how much we loved him. To share Shiraz and Antipasto, to laugh gently or wryly or robustly. The entire of its self-quote is from John Donne's Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. It goes on that anyone's death diminishes me because I am involved in humankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. <laughs> and what is it that we are doing here today if it isn't making a devotion upon an emergent occasion in our lives, if it isn't recognising the life that Noel brought to our living and recognising that the bell tolls for he and me and we and thee. Vale. Thank you, Catherine. Tony Connolly, Noel's only surviving sibling, following medical advice, is not able to be here today. However, he's not only with us online, he has sent a personal message about his brother Noel, known among the family as John. So I invite Ray Scanlon to read that brotherly message. And it is a privilege that uh, I have to be able to read this uh, for Anthony. Noel John Connolly, henceforth referred to as John, as this is the name he was known by in our family, our father also having the name Noel John Connolly. Our parents married during the Second World War, and John was born on the 24th of January, 1945, the first of three children, followed by our sister Mary, in 1947 and myself in 1949. Sadly, our sister died after childbirth in 1971. Shortly after I was born, the family moved into our home at 11 Church Street, Gympie. It was while we lived there that all three of us received our education. As the name of the street suggests, a considerable area was owned and occupied by the Catholic Church, including St. Patrick's Church, the Christian Brothers College, together with the Brothers House, and boarding schools, and similarly with the Sisters of Mercy. The conventional Catholic education at that time was that all children attended the Convent of Mercy for preschool and grades one and two. Thereafter, the girls proceeded with their education at the convent college and the boys transferred to the Christian brothers for the remainder of their education. And so it was with John. Following my brother through the system, I soon realized that there was a high academic expectation from me because of the achievements of my brother who preceded me. It was obvious from all, it was obvious to all from an early stage that John was a natural student and a born leader. This was reflected not only in his academic achievements, but also in sports. As well as being school captain in his senior year, he was also captain of the school's rugby league team. During his final year at the Brothers, he was mentored by
by the local parish priest, the Reverend Dr. Kinney. A little family aside, during our school years, our family became very friendly with another family who, was also, who also has students at the Brothers College and the Mercy Convent. The name of the family was O'Farrell. The family owned a dairy farm in the Mary Valley, a surrounding district. Both mothers were very close, so much so that they had paired off as a likely couple, John and their daughter Anne. It therefore came as a great surprise when John decided to join the Columban Missionary Fathers and Anne joined the Sisters of Mercy. The friendship between these two has lasted a lifetime. John left our home in 1962 to attend the Columban Seminary at Sassafras in the Dandenong Ranges. He was very taken with the Art Deco building bequeathed by the Nicholas family. The following year, he moved to the seminary at Taramara for the remainder of his training, which had the unfortunate effect of making him a manly football supporter. During his seminary years, he had the privilege of meeting many of his fellow seminarians before they were ordained as priests and sent to all corners of the earth. The next major family event was when John was ordained at St. Patrick's Catholic Church on June the 30th, 1965. Sometime later, we farewelled him at the Brisbane Wharf on his way to the missions in Korea. He enrolled in the Seoul University and became proficient in the Korean language, which was a great source of pride for him. Shortly after, as told to his family, he received a direction from the society to move to Rome. Although his heart was set on serving in the mission in Korea, he accepted the decision. He was fortunately able to be present and celebrate a requiem mass at the time of our sister's death on the 17th of March, 1971, and our parents' deaths, both in 1995. I should add that he was instrumental in both our parents being admitted in their later years to Nazareth House, in which they were cared for by the Sisters of Nazareth. Since his return to reside in Australia, domiciled at Taramara, initially as rector of the seminary, we have been able to continue our regular family relationship on more intimate terms. John has been a regular annual, annual visitor to my home in Brisbane when his commitments and time would allow. His visits were greatly anticipated by myself, my wife, and my son. John always had a gift for his nephew, Martin. We always celebrated this occasion with a meal in a local restaurant. He again repeated his plans to financially assist Martin in his education. The last meal we celebrated together was in January this year. Unfortunately, he was unable to eat most of his meal. He said he was then travelling to Toowoomba as part of his duties before returning to Sydney. He started he stated, although 75 years of age, he had absolutely no intention of ever retiring. He kept me regularly informed in particular since his current illness was diagnosed several years ago, advising me of his concern for me and instructing me to see my GP and be tested for prostate cancer. Since that time, he has kept me informed of the various treatments and procedures he was undergoing. On his visit in January, he told me he was commencing a treatment of chemotherapy which would continue each three weeks until September 2020. However, 
during our regular contact by mobile phone, particularly since his recent admission to Concord General Hospital. We have been in daily contact until shortly before his death. He advised me he was about to start a new experiment, treat, experimental treatment of injections into the affected area. Our last contact was last week when he told me in a rather breathless voice that he was having a blood transfusion before being transferred to St. Vincent's Hospital for the treatment. When Paul rang me to advise that John had passed away at 7 p.m. on Saturday the 6th of June 2020, it came as a great shock. He will be greatly missed by myself and my family. During my recent conversation with Patrick, I advised sadly that on the advice of my consultant specialist, because of the risk to my health, I, un I am unable to attend in person at his requiem mass. I did, however, express my wish to supply a written testament to my brother to be included in the ceremony. Patrick has advised me that I and my family will be able to participate through online media. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Tony and Ray. Another who could not be here today is Noel's Columban classmate, Father Kel Barrett, and I invite another classmate, Michael Schell, to read Kel's message. Good morning, everyone. You see before you this morning a reincarnation of Kelvin Barrett. And those who know Kelvin, he's screaming inside, trying to get out at this stage. And I have the privilege of reading his little message to Noel and to each one of you. But I had the very strict instruction when I said, Kel, how flexible is this text? He said, what scripsy, scripsy. What I have written, I have written. So, no, but uh, this, so this is Kel. No, your passing leaves a large empty space in my and all our hearts. It was on a ship traveling to Korea in 1970 that along with Barry Martin, that, that the two of us started to get to know each other. I mean to say three, in, three young men in one cabin certainly facilitated some sort of growth in relationship. Three quite different men on the same journey. The passengers on this ship assigned to the priest's table were to initially offered cons uh, cons commiserations by the rest of the crew, you know, but sorry to put you on that table, but only to be re replaced in some time by sheer envy because our table became known as the fun table with conversations filled with endless jokes and tales, some taller than others, and this continued in language school. where he and I, where you and I studied together. It's like we were toddlers struggling to find our way in a new culture and a new language. But you were the front runner and always the missionary. Then we ended up together on the staff at Taramara for nearly 10 years. We were cutting our teeth in leadership, albeit at, le at different levels. Noel at an administrative level, me as a budding spiritual director. There was conflict as we sorted out our new responsibilities. 
but subsequently you introduced me later to the Irish way of life and its special way of speaking. At the same time, we came to know and share friends. And through you, I came to understand and appreciate more fully our fellow Irish brothers and sisters with whom we had traveled the long road in Korea. More recently, we challenged each other over the type of formation needed to us for our students and in other issues. We also shared times of illness. And in this shared weakness, we found a deep respect and compassion for each other. This whole journey to become a friend with you, Noel, I treasure immensely. Well, Noel, I know you are a true Christian through and through. I see you as a Columban, thick and thin. I'm not sure about the thin. As a man of the gospel, preached and lived with passion. As a missionary who explored the outer lessons of life. And as an academic who treasured right practice first of all. You explored the boundaries of all possibilities in so many areas, none of which were beyond your endeavor. I remember you as a man of hospitality. You enjoyed life to the full. You loved eating in company. For you, it was a time of camaraderie, of stories both serious and light-hearted, peppered with banter and stirring your companions always with a cheeky grin and a devilish chuckle. I cannot forget that for many years the wine consumed on such occasions was rated and recorded in your ubiquitous black book, the loss of which devastated Noel. Unlike you, my black book only contained the names of future equine winners. I respect you as a fiercely human person who shared yourself with sometimes disarming frankness and honesty, filled with a compassion for others that invited them to join with you on the journey of life. At the same time, I experienced a man of strength and drive, not just as a marathon runner, but in the strength of your character. You showed enormous courage, self-belief and hope in the face of opposition and more recently in the face of sickness. Most of all, you lived your life as a man of deep down-to-earth faith showing belief in a loving God who has called us to live the values of the kingdom. As you committed yourself to live this reign of God in your life, now I am sure you are enjoying the loving embrace of the God who called you to be so fiercely human, a faithful Christian, a tireless missionary, and such a very happy and committed Columban. Thank you for the, this journey together, Noel. I express my gratitude on my own behalf, but I'm sure all your classmates would echo these words, plus others from their experience of knowing you. You are a big man. You leave us with a deep sense of emptiness. However, you have left us with many memories which fill that empty space and will nourish our lives forevermore. Goodbye, Noel, for, for now. Your good friend, Kelvin. Thank you, Kel, and thank you, Mick. 
Archbishop Mark Coleridge, President of the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference, has also sent a message. And I invite Lana Turvey Collins, Noel's colleague at Catholic Mission, and on the 2020 Plenary Council Facilitation Team to read the Archbishop's message. Hello, everyone. My name is Lana, as Pat has said, and I was first Noel's student and uh, over time his colleague with all of my Plenary Council and Catholic Mission family. And in time, uh, I loved him and he became a dear family friend. So it's an honour to read this message on behalf of not just the bishops, but the last work that he gave his everything to that I was privileged to be able to share the space with him in. There were many blessings, this is, this is Mark. There were many blessings in my early years of study in Rome. And one of them was living with the Columbans at their place in Corso, Trieste. In those four years, I came to appreciate the Columban style, down to earth, good humored, no nonsense, compassionate and cosmopolitan. I learned a lot from them. I didn't meet Noel Connolly in those days, but I did hear his name. He was already a bit of a legend. It was only later when I was back in Australia that our paths crossed. And after that, we came to know each other well. But it was only when I came to Brisbane that I discovered that Noel was a gimpy boy, a son of the Archdiocese of Brisbane. There's a friendliness in the DNA in this part of the world. So in Knoll, I could see how the Queensland friendliness had fused with the Columban style. As he grew older, Knoll lost none of the fire in his belly, and it was the plenary council which set that fire ablaze. He could see what a gift of God it was to the church in Australia at this difficult time, and he busted himself to make sure that the plenary council journey was firmly grounded and headed in the right direction. I'm not sure if Noel had too many regrets when death came, but one regret surely was that he won't be around for the Plenary Council Assemblies. But at least now, we'll have a larger than life friend interceding for the council with with just as much energy as he gave to the earthly task, even if the assemblies won't be quite so much fun without him. The Columbans gave new life to the old Irish devotion of the Peregrinatio Pro Cristo, the pilgrimage for Christ. Noel headed off in so many different directions through his life landing wherever the boat took him. Noel, now he sets forth finally to the end of the journey that began long ago in Gympie. Thanks, Noel, for everything you've given us here in Australia and far beyond. Now rest in peace on the other side of the shore. Mark Coleridge, Archbishop of Brisbane. Thank you, Archbishop Mark, and thank you, Lana. And for all those who shared messages, and most especially for the one about whom they spoke and wrote, could you please be upstanding? And a round of applause, a standing ovation for now. Let us pray. Lord God, you chose our brother Noel to serve your people as a priest and missionary and to share the joys and burdens of their lives. Look with mercy on him and give him the reward of his labors, the fullness of life promised to those who preach your holy gospel. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now we have the first reading.
A reading from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. As for me, my life is already being poured away as a libation, and the time has come for me to be gone. I have fought the good fight to the end. I have run the race to the finish. I have kept the faith. All there is to come now is the crown of righteousness reserved for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Happy are those who have died in the Lord. Let them rest from their labors, for their good deeds go with them. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to your Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as he usually did. He stood up to read, and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives and to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favour. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the assistant and sat down, and all eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. I feel a little sympathy for St. Luke when he had to write a story about Jesus after hearing all the stories that have been told about Noel this morning, it's very hard to know where to start. Because the reading that we have here in St Luke's Gospel is the 
policy speech of Jesus. It was the key message that Luke had worked out after 50 years after Jesus had died. When he, Luke was writing the story about Jesus, what was he going to say? And what he did was he reached back 500 years to a scriptural text, to a text that had been read and read amongst the Jewish people, to, to the prophet Isaiah. And I, when I was thinking about what to say about Noel, I thought, well, would I do the same thing? I reached back to the message that Luke had written and said that this describes the mission of Noel. There are many things that have been said about Noel, but I think his passion for mission summarizes for me very much what he was about. He was a hard worker, yes, but what made that, what gave him that drive was a passion to serve people the same sort of passion that drove Jesus. Jesus' mission was a response to the people that he saw in front of him. He met these people where they were, he came to understand them, and he knew they needed a new message, that there was more life, there was more to life than what these people had known. And I think it was the same with Jesus, with Noel. I'm getting too confused now. But when each one people talk about Noel, there's no one message that Noel has. It is a message to help encourage that person to live, to come to a fuller life. I also chose this Luke 4 because this Luke 4 was very important to us at the time that Noel was going on mission. When we were all young missionaries, we were working in tough places. Noel was in Korea with uh, President Park, with all the troubles and strife that was going on there. Bishop G was in jail. The Columbans were growing beards as a form of protest. The Columbans were dealing with Pinochet in Chile. There were various uh, military dictators in Peru. Guys who got kicked out of Fiji and out of Taiwan. And in the Philippines, uh, President Marcos still maintained martial law. What sort of message do you preach? And it was a message, I suppose, that's often summarized by saying, priests need to get out of the sacristy and get to be with the people. That's what Noel has done all his life. That is what we are encouraged to do by Jesus ourselves, to get out of our own little comfort zones and go and to meet people where they are. Saint Fra Pope Francis always describes these people as people on the periphery. Go and meet the people where they are. I can remember hearing that message and think, isn't this fabulous? Our hearts are moved with compassion when we see the poor and the suffering. And when we realize that this is the message of Jesus to help and to be with these people, it becomes a bit of a burden until I realized, no, the spirit of the Lord is upon us to help us to meet the burdens of the people. I think when Noel and the the whole process of the Plenary Council, the church today in Australia and across the world is faced with the same issue. We face the people, we get to open our eyes to the needs of the people in front of us, and we are moved by the Spirit of God. It's not just us. Just to use a couple of examples, Black Lives Matter protests across our world. It's been startling, hasn't it? The death of one man has released an enormous power of hurt, burden, anger, struggle, desire for justice across our world. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And it will be resolved only by the work of the Holy Spirit and those people who are open to be, to be used by the Spirit to bring about justice for the people. When the Me Too movement started, I was surprised to think this wasn't started by an institution. This wasn't started by a church. This wasn't started by a government body. This was started by women who stood up and said, no longer are we going to be abused and put up with it. Where did they find that courage? Where did they find that vision, that drive? It was from the Spirit. What other things are works of the Spirit across our world? Obviously, climate change movement. That whole movement struggles. This is a work of the Spirit of God. So I think Luke 4 summarizes not only Noel's life, but it also challenges us to carry on the mission of Noel, to carry on the mission of the Spirit of God. Let us pray for each other 
in that mission. So yes, let us pray for Noel and for ourselves. Dear friends, as we gather here today to pray for our departed brother Noel, let us also pray for the church, for peace in our world and for ourselves. We pray that all of us, Noel's family members, his, his friends and his fellow Columbans may be comforted in our grief by the Lord who wept at the friend of his friend, Lazarus. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the members of Noel's family who gave gone before us, his mother Sarah May, his father Noel and his sister Mary. May God grant them an everlasting home with Christ. Lord hear us. Lord hear our prayer. We pray for Noel's many friends in Australia and in other parts of the world, his Columban brothers and lay missionaries. We know that we are with us in spirit today. May God comfort and strengthen them in the sadness and prayers. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in thanksgiving for the loving care and treatment Noel received from doctors and nurses and many others during his illness. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. We give thanks for Noel's life, his faith, his missionary zeal, his courage and his friendship with all of us and many others. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, hear the prayers of your people made with gratitude and trust. We ask you to heal our grief and fill us with hope. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
We pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands with the praise and glory of God's name for our good and all the of the Church. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant Noel, we beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving saviour may find in him a merciful judge. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominations, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 holy Lord God of hosts, Lord heaven and earth are, are full of your glory. glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to be, held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church is spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Anthony, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember your servant, Noel, whom you have called today from this world to yourself. Grant that he who is united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, 
St. Columban, St. Mary MacKillop, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages. We may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and, and with him, him and, and in him, in the, unity of, God, Lord, just, in the, the unity of the Holy Spirit, Spirit all, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. At the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our, Our Father, Lord, who art in heaven, Lord, hallowed be thy name. Lord, thy kingdom come, Lord, thy will be done Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Shalom, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. Who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of the risen Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am unworthy that you should enter my life, but only say the word of my soul to you. May the body and blood of Christ keep us safe for everlasting life. communion there will be two points of distribution at the front on either side.
Let us pray. Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our brother Noel may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. If you could be seated, please, for one moment. On behalf of the Connolly families, the Columbans, and Noel's many friends, I acknowledge the many who have supported us at this time by their prayers and messages of condolence. Our thanks to all who contributed to this liturgy. Special thanks to Noel's colleagues at Catholic Mission for leading the singing, to Trevor for his words of inspiration, to the fellow concelebrants, to Father Jack and the parish staff for their hospitality, uh, to the staff at CMC for preparing the booklet and the memorial card, and to all of you for your participation. Uh, thanks to St. Martha's Parish School for allowing us to use the school hall for serving refreshments, which is to your right, through the yard, and up the stairs. There are both stairs and a lift, so use whatever is appropriate. Please be mindful of physical distancing. Uh, there are sanitizers available, and rather than helping yourself, as Noel would say, allow yourself to be served. Burial will take place in the Columban plot at Macquarie Park Cemetery, corner of Delhi and Plassey Roads, North Ride. Details are in your booklets. Uh, the hearse will be leaving at about quarter to one. So my thanks to each and every one of you here present in the church and watching the live streaming, for being with us today, for what you have done for Noel in his life, for what you meant to him, to the Connolly families and to the Columbans. I now invite Father Peter O'Neill, the Columban leader in Australia, to lead the final commendation. Trusting in God, we have prayed together for Noel, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Noel again and enjoy his friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of God's kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ. Saints of God, come to his aid. Hasten to meet him, angels of the Lord. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. May Christ, who called you, take you to himself. May angels lead you to Abraham's side. Receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. 
receive his soul and present him to God the Most High. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Noel in the sure and certain hope that, together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon Noel in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother Noel forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless and keep us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.